Welcome back everybody to the Law of Trusts. In this lesson we are moving on to the next of our major topics. Focusing on this idea of the creation of the express trust, talking about how they're made and the general requirements that are that are necessary for them to be valid or to be sufficient. And this involves having a conversation at great detail and in great length, which is what we're going to do, about the idea of the three certainties. The three certainties all have to be present in order for the creation of an express trust to actually be valid. So essentially, we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at what the three certainties are, what it means to essentially uh, sufficiently meet the three certainties, and then to talk about how we apply the three certainties in the application of, for example, the fixed trust versus, uh, for example, the discretionary trust. But this lesson is going to take something of an introduction to the idea of the three certainties, and we'll talk about those other things in more detail as we go on throughout the lessons. So, what are the three certainties? Essentially, we know already that the creation of a trust will involve the splitting of legal and equitable title um, or equitable title to property uh, and then distributing those rights accordingly. You distribute those rights in the sense of you distribute the legal title to the trustee and then you distribute the equitable title to that of the beneficiary and then you have the fiduciary relationship which exists between the trustee and the beneficiary. Now, the idea of and the process of doing so requires quite a few steps in order to essentially create a valid trust instrument. Of course, you have to make sure that legal title is actually properly transferred, which is something that we're going to get to in the fourth topic, which is talks, uh, talks about the constitution of a trust. But then we have to think about the formalities that are required for the creation of a trust, the three certainties. And in the creation of an equitable right in property, we know that the equitable right exists with the beneficiaries and the legal rights exist with the trustee. And so in doing so, what the settler or testator has done in an express trust um, is essentially done something which is expressly creating an instrument which exists in the nature of, uh, of a trust. It exists in this kind of way. And they must do so by adhering to a number of certainties. So, for example... It must be shown that the settler had actually intended to create a trust in the first place. It also has to be shown what exactly is going to be put on trust and that this is clearly identifiable. And then finally, the settler has to be very clear in identifying who will be the beneficiary of the trust. And these are essentially the three certainties, okay? And these three certainties exist in this way. You have the certainty of intention, you have the certainty of objects, and you have the certainty of subject matter. Ordinarily, you would put subject matter second, and that's how we're going to be describing it in, um, in, this, in this lesson. So, certainty of intention, very clear. Is it obvious, and it is, is it certain that the person who is putting this property on trust intends to create a trust? Or are they just simply creating um, something which may be a gift? Or are they just lending the property for a uh, specific duration of time, at which point they want to have that property back? So that's what the certainty of intention tells us. The certainty of subject matter is uh, easy to understand as well, because it is asking us, what is the subject matter? What are the things that we are putting on trust? And are we clearly able to define what they are? OK, we can't use sort of nebulous, abstract concepts to define what the certainty of subject matter is. So as a result of which, the certainty of subject matter is also very important, clearly delimiting what is and what isn't the property in question. And then finally, the certainty of objects, which is also clearly delineating who is and who isn't the beneficiary of the trust. And one of the most landmark cases which establishes these three certainties is the case of Knight and Knight from 1840. In this case, the settler had left his estates to his brother, um, and then his brother then left them to his son. Okay, I'm not going to start naming what the estates are and who the people are, because it gets very, very complicated in terms of these very old-timey languages and the, the ways in which these trust instruments were created in the 1840s. So you have a testator, who is obviously um, the, uh, somebody who has died, who, who leaves the estates to his brother, and then his brother has that property, who then leaves them to his son. 
it was clear from the will of the original testator, the original individual who had placed the estates in the hands of his brother, that the estates he be passed to the descendant um, in the direct male line of the grand, of the testator's grandfather. And so when the son died in testate, i.e. died without a will, the brother would settle the estates not in line with the terms of the will. And this is really where we see the creation of some kind of legal uncertainty um, uh, start to crop up and why we have a case. Now, the question, one of the questions that was um, made um, was this idea of the creation of the trust. Was this a trust and was there therefore an obligation on the part of the person who was receiving the legal title to execute the will and to execute the trust in a way as stated in the manner that they wanted it to be done? And Lord Langdale held that the wording of the will was not sufficiently certain to justify the creation of a trust. And so as a result of which, the, the estate was held to be an absolute gift rather than a trust that had to be held on, uh, on the basis of some kind of, or for some kind of beneficiary. And so the legal test which was formulated to determine whether or not a trust existed and not just an absolute gift, for example, was the three certainties test as defined earlier on. Welcome back everybody to the Law of Trusts. In this lesson we're continuing to talk about the three certainties, focusing on the first of these three certainties in this lesson. This is of course the certainty of intention. We'll explore what the certainty of intention entails in this lesson and we'll talk about some of the legal issues that arise from trying to establish intention for the creation of an express trust. So we outlined the view in the previous lesson from the case from 1840 of night and night that in order for a trust to be created an express trust to be created so we're not talking about constructive or resulting trusts in terms of implied trusts we're talking about an express trust there must be a certainty of intention a certainty of subject matter and a certainty of objects it has to be clearly certain that the individual who is placing that property on trust intended to create a trust it has to be very certain uh, and clearly uh, definable and delineatable what that property actually is and we have to be very clear in and defining the ability to understand essentially who the beneficiaries are so uh, who is and who isn't a beneficiary those are the three certainties so what does the certainty of intention tell us therefore well it just tells us that in order for an individual to create a trust it must be very clear that they have the intention to do so that they have clearly intended to do um, the creation of a trust and not say some other kind of legal relationship the case of night and night as we remember from the previous lesson illustrated this example quite nicely because it was held to be the case that the will was an absolute gift rather than a trust owing to a lack of, of certainty in terms of intention, subject matter, and objects. And so this is why this, uh, the certainty of intention is so important in the formation of a trust. But it should also be noted that the test for showing uh, the certainty of intention uh, is relatively vague. And the reason for this is there is no one single de definitive method by which we can show and prove the certainty of intention. There's no clear objective test that we can just rely on that is established in some case or some statute for determining what the certainty of intention is, determining whether or not there is a certainty of intention. And so as a result of which, the courts have taken various different approaches on various accounts of how to show a certainty of intention in any given scenario. Now, the first thing to note when we think about this certainty of intention is we have to also think about the equitable maxim, which states that equity will look to substance rather than form. What does this mean? In the context of the conversation that we're having, what this essentially means is that determinations of a trust and whether or not there was an intention to create a trust may depend on the actions of a settler rather than the specific words cited in this alleged trust instrument. So you have to go further than just reading the document itself, which is alleged to have been a trust, because the words may say one thing, but if everything else to the contrary says another thing, uh, then 
owing to the fact that equity looks at substance rather than just at form, it therefore means that we have to think about whether or not a, a, a trust was actually created owing to the actions of the settler or the testator rather than the specific words cited. Now, there are plenty of cases that illustrate this particular principle. And I've gone for a very recent case from 2020 uh, of, the, uh, of the High Commissioner for Pakistan. And the reason why is because A, this is a complicated case, and B, this is a case which is quite interesting in terms of establishing a certainty of intention. So ultimately, this, this case dates all the way back to the partition of India in the 1940s, I believe, when the transfer of money by the, uh, at the time, um, Nazam of, of, of Hyderabadad, which I am not very good at the pronunciations before anybody comes at me in the comments, um, essentially they transferred money to the High Commissioner of Pakistan in the United Kingdom. The monetary value of this fund had grown from the original £1 million all the way back in the 1940s to a staggering £35 million in today's revenue. Now, the family of the Nizam had sought over the years to recover this money, and they launched a number of proceeding, uh, proceedings sorry, at a number of different times. Uh, a new round of proceedings was to, uh, was to take place um, in 2013 by Pakistan specifically. Now, in two, the 2013 proceedings came against NatWest. NatWest were the original repositories for the money. So the original um, bank in which the, the money was first deposited was NatWest. And so the first of the proceedings in 2013 came by Pakistan to, um, the, to, to NatWest as they were the original um, repository. Now, the issues in this case was the question for the court, essentially, was whether or not Pakistan had some beneficial interest or was a trustee in terms of the, the, the money, the High Commissioner for Pakistan. And it was held that no express trust would arise since the original transfer of the property was done by an agent of the Nizam who did not have the authority to create a trust. And so in doing so, this case does a number of things. Firstly, it gives us an indication as to the determination of the certainty of intention. This is in the case where we have the allegation of a trust being created by a third party. This third party in question was, of course, the agent of the Nizam. Secondly, it gives us some insight into the language used in the process of creating a trust and that the impact of this language. The impact of this language has essentially the use of the term trust is by no means conclusive as to the existence of an express trust. It is one of the factors that must be taken into account when considering whether or not a trust has been created. So that's quite interesting. And this adheres to the principle of equity seeking substance rather than form or acting on substance rather than form. Because what it says here is that just because it says trust, that doesn't mean anything. Because in this case, the authority to create a trust had not been granted to the agent of the Nizam. And so as a result of which, the fact that there was the word trust utilized in the creation of this instrument is meaningless, given the fact that there are other factors that must be taken into account. And this gives rise to one of the biggest issues when it comes to the certainty of intention. And this refers to the kind of language that is used in the creation of a trust. Now, we highlight and we uh, single out this idea of precatory language for a number of reasons. Because in determining the certainty of intention, how much weight should be given to certain words and the use of different types of language. Now, this is where we get to this idea of precatory language or precatory words. A precatory word or a, a precatory expression, should I say, is a, a set of words, expression, sentence, phrase, which expresses some kind of hope or desire. So, for example, the easiest one is, I hope that, blah, 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 blah. I hope that the, the property is put on tr trust, or I hope that this happens, or I hope that this person becomes the benefit of this, um, of this money that I've left in my will. I desire you to. I desire you to hold this property for, 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 for my um, family, for example. In law, when we think about precatory language, and we think about it in relation to the certainty of intention, the language itself 
I hope that, or I desire you to, is not enough in and of itself to find the determination of an express trust. You can't just go, if you had a problem question, and the problem question was asking you to essentially unpack the certainty of intention, and you had this, uh, it had a trust instrument in front of you, and in that we use lots of different precatory pieces of language, you can't just say, well, because of the use of this language, therefore a trust exists in and of itself. In modern law, the aim is to try and find language which points to a legal obligation rather than just some kind of want or desire. This is not to suggest, though, that the use of precatory language will nullify the existence of a trust. If you have all the required prerequisites, all the intention that you could possibly need to create a trust, and you just so happen to use the phrase, I hope that, or I desire you to, that could still be enough to satisfy the certainty of intention. But the modern law wants to be more certain in trying to establish a legal relationship here, because I desire you to does not necessarily imply that you are essentially expressing the idea of a legal obligation, which is what a trust would be, or I hope that. So language which points to a legal obligation is a lot more strong, is a lot stronger, should I say, than that of um, precatory language. Indeed, too, it should be noted that um, we're talking not about moral obligations either. We're talking about legal obligations. The trust is a legal instrument, is the creation of equity. And so as a result of which, this idea of a moral obligation is also meaningless, whether or not you're moral or not. The idea is here, we're talking about le legality and legal obligations. So let's think about the case of Lamb and Ames from 1871. Essentially, in this case, the testator, the person who is leaving the property on trust at the, uh, the point at which he dies, um, would leave his estate to his wife. The wording of the will stated that the estate, quote, be at her disposal in any way she may think best for the benefit of herself and her family. That is the sort of key part of the will that is important for our examinations. Now, the question that the court may ask is, was there a trust? Is this property being held on trust? Therefore, was there a necessary certainty of intention? Well, the language was determined in this case to be too, uh, to be the, uh, sorry, was determined to be precatory language. And so it did not impose the intention necessary to create an express trust. So think how strong of a uh, of a statement you have to make if this statement here is not enough to show the certainty of intention necessary to create an express trust if the phrase the the estate will be at her disposal in any way she may think best for the benefit of herself and her family that was not considered to be strong enough to create legal intention and you can understand why because it seems to be a passage that you would see in a will that um doesn't necessarily impose any kind of legal obligation. The wife, sorry, the husband who has died has not suggested that the wife would be legally bound to hold this property on trust for the benefit of herself as a beneficiary and her family. This doesn't seem to make much sense. And so as a result of which, this idea of precatory language is very important. In 1948, we have a famous case here of uh, the, the Steel Wills Trusts. Uh, again, this was a case which involved the use of language, but in this case, the use of language was done by a legal professional. And what is interesting, and, and some of you might think is not particularly fair in this case, is that the legal professional in question, the solicitor, had actually used language which had been sufficient to create a trust in previous case law, but more modern case law, at least at the time, the more modern case law, actually showed that it failed to meet the standard threshold. So this legal professional essentially had not been had not done their homework in terms of um, keeping up to date with the kind of language which is necessary to show a certainty of intention. So he uses uh, or they use a, a, a piece of language that used to be sufficient, but then maybe isn't sufficient in a more modern context. The language was specifically, um, quote, I request my son, uh, my said son to do all in his power, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this was, again, the use of precatory language, and so there was, should have been no certainty of intention, okay? Now, the reason why it was held to be the case that there was a certainty of intention was owing to the fact that the solicitor, in creating the will, had utilised language which was 
from previous precedent and that which the courts determined previously was sufficient to create and to find the certainty of intention. This is a relatively controversial decision, but you can understand the, un the, the basis and the rationale for this decision because essentially what the courts do here is look a little bit further than just the words that are used in the will itself. The words that are used in the will itself is are not sufficient to create uh, the certainty of intention because uh, modern case law has come and gone and it, ha and it has essentially updated the standard by which we understand the certainty of intention. But the fact that the legal professional was creating a will and in doing so went and had a look at the cases maybe from their old previous uh, university notes um, to see what kind of language was sufficient for the certainty of intention and that because they were using language from a previous precedent it clearly shows that even if the language wasn't sufficient today it was clearly the intention of the legal professional to use the language which would have been the creation of a trust they were just incompetent in their job if you will in not being able to use the more up-to-date date language which would have been more sufficient for the certainty of intention so you can understand the judgment in that regard but you can still understand why it's a controversial decision because the language in and of itself would not have been sufficient for the creation of a certainty of intention so in the previous lesson we talked about the certainty of intention which is the first of the major certainties required for the creation of an express trust in this lesson, we're going to talk about the certainty of subject matter, the idea of being able to clearly delineate the kind of property which can and cannot be held on trust. So essentially, that's what we're going to do. And when it comes to the idea of the kinds of things that can be put on trust, this is where we have a number of different issues. OK, and there are plenty of cases which essentially illustrates different kinds of properties which may or may not be able to be put on trust. So when we refer to the idea of the certainty of subject matter, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about what the property is in question that is going to be held on trust by the trustee for the benefit of a beneficiary. So it's the thing that the settler or the testator is transferring legal title to the trustee. Now, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, the certainty of subject matter can be satisfied by examining essentially the vast majority of different kinds of property. It can include land, it can include money, like a bank account, it can include personal goods, so your laptop, TVs, it can include securities, so debt and equity securities, so for example stocks and shares in a company or bonds um, in a corporation. It can include any of those things, okay? It could also include copyright, Future property or the acquisition of new property, however, can never be the um, kinds of property that can exist on trust. You have to have the ability to put on trust a thing that exists at the time at which you are um, creating the trust. OK, so this may be tangible or intangible. So it could be the the uh, a security in a company or it could be land or it could be money. Um, it could be movable or removable. But it has to be something that you have. It can't be the idea of property in the future um, being held on trust for somebody. That does not represent the certainty of subject matter. It doesn't represent the certainty of ownership of your own property because you don't, you're not certain that you're going to acquire new property. And so this must be distinguished from the existing property in question. So you have to very clearly demarcate what the property is. What is this property? What isn't? The property okay and what i'm going to intend to put on trust the main consideration here is that the subject matter for the trust should be clearly identifiable i should be able to have a look at it and go that's a property so if i was to put wanted to put my laptop on trust that's clearly a a very easy thing to do to satisfy the certainty of subject matter my laptop is a very clear piece of property it is uh, clearly delineated it is not your laptop it is not the concept of laptops generally it is a specific item that i own i could even go even uh, deeper and, and name the specific um the specific brand laptop the specific item as well and say this is going to be held on trust and so as a result of which that would represent a certainty of subject matter Let's think about some of the interesting cases which challenge the idea of certainty of subject matter. The first one is the London Wine Corporation case, 
Ultimately, what this was a case about was a, uh, a case which involved a wine dealer who was the defendant, uh, and they had sold wine, lots of different bottles of wine, lots of different um, crates of wine or whatever, to a variety of different customers, okay, as you would expect being a wine dealer. The sale of the wine was made through contracts, and the wine would be kept in the warehouse of the defendant. So ownership of the wine was shown and certified through these contractual arrangements okay now the customers would be given certificates of title to the wine and they would also be charged for the storage of the wine as insurance okay so they would pay for the storage of the wine in this warehouse and they would be given certificates of what the wine is okay you own this wine now the thing to note about this particular case and the thing that is so critical for the certainty of subject matter is that the wine would not be delineated from each customer there was no indication as to which exact bottle of wine each customer owned so let's say there was two customers and they both owned um two bottles of pinot grigio each okay the problem here is the bottles of Pinot Grigio, um, there would be four bottles of Pinot Grigio and there would be two certificates that says you own two um, bottles of this Pinot Grigio and, and you own two bottles of Pinot Grigio as well. But if we were to look at the four bottles of Pinot Grigio that were in the warehouse, it was not clear which of the four belonged to the first customer and then which of the four belonged to the other customer. So how were you able to delineate it? You aren't going to be able to delineate it. All that was known was that you had ownership by the way of these certificates, but we didn't know which specific bottles you could find uh, and pick out. There weren't labels on the bottles that matched the certificate of title to a customer, for example. So the question here is, when the defendant goes into liquidation, and the defendant goes insolvent and a liquidator comes and wants to start selling off assets to pay off creditors, the question of property was established because the customers argued that the wine was actually theirs. They had equitable title to the property, to the wine, and they it was being held by uh, sorry held on trust by the defendant for them as beneficiaries and so as a result of which it would mean that the liquidator had no uh, ability to actually go about and um, sell that property off because it wasn't their property it wasn't even the def the defendant's property either they no longer had equitable title and so it would protect against creditors who sought recovery when the co company went into insolvency so it's very important because if this wasn't established then it would would mean that the liquidator had the ability to to take that wine and to sell it off to uh, for the creditors now the courts held that because there was no way to clearly delimit who owned which bottles of wine the claim failed on the basis of there was a lack of sufficient subject matter uh, justice oliver argued that i cannot see how for instance a farmer who declares himself the trustee of two sheep without identifying them can be said to have created a perfect trust so if there was a field full of about a thousand sheep, okay, massive field, and a sheep farmer comes along and says, I own two of them. And the response is, well, which two do you own? And he says, well, I don't know. I just own two sheep, okay. Uh, how can that create a perfect trust for uh, certainty of subject matter? In a similar way, in a warehouse full of bottles of wine, uh, a, a customer can go along with a certificate and say, I own two bottles of this wine in this warehouse. I've got a certificate that proves it. I've bought it. I've paid for it. I have, uh, I have paid for it by insurance or whatever. And they go, okay, well, which two bottles? Well, I don't know because I can't clearly delimit who owns which bottle of wine. That is the point of this case. Hunter and Moss from 1994 is actually quite a similar case, but it actually rules in a different way. Uh, because the defendant in this case had owned 950 of the 1,000 shares that existed in the company. So a significant majority of the corporation. They had made an oral declaration of 50 shares to the claimant to be held on trust, and this represented about 5% of the share capital. Now, the issues here was, if we were to apply the, the ruling in, in, in the London Wine Corporation, you could make the argument that because we're not able to clearly identify each share, there must surely be a lack of 
sufficient subject matter or sufficient certainty of subject matter because in the same way that we couldn't the customers couldn't clearly label and delimit which of the bottles of wine were theirs you can't go and clearly limit and delimit which of the shares of these 50 shares from the 1000 or or from the 950 were yours and so in applying real and wine corporation that is the answer that you would get but it was held that this case is different to the wine corporation case and the reason why is because there had been the passing of property in chattel in the first example and this is the passing of property by way of security in a company in the second example so the reason why it's different is because the intangible assets such as shares shouldn't need to be clearly delimited from the rest of the subject matter of the trust because ultimately there is no way of being able to tell the difference of the of shares in a corporation in rewind uh, sorry re london wine corporation it could have been very easily the case that when a customer purchases a bottle of wine and that bottle of wine is then held in the warehouse the defendant could have put a little label on that bottle of wine to clearly make it um, to clearly mark out who owns that bottle you can't do that with shares because if you just say I have 50 shares of the 950 of a company, a share is a share. They are un I, they are undistinguishable from the rest. OK, and it would also mean uh, so as a result of which, sorry, Hunter and Moss, it was held that there was a valid trust here. But it would also mean that if this if we were to apply re London um, Wine Corporation, then pretty much any other case which involved shares being held on trust would fail and so therefore shares would not be able to represent trust uh, the property on trust so that doesn't seem to make much sense in continuing then let's have a look at this idea of the gold corp exchange case from 1995 this case gives us a clear delineation between the re london wine case and the hunter and moss case because in this case the idea of chattel which is homogenous is the question of subject matter okay so it sort of sits in the middle between hunter and moss and london wine corporation because in hunter and moss you had uh, intangible property which was homogenous and in london wine corporation you had chattel which was non-homogenous well now we have a case where we have chattel which is homogenous okay the questions in this case revolved around the idea of gold bullion which formed the subject matter. The sellers of the bullion had given the customers certificates of title in a very similar way to the London Wine case, but they had also not segregated the property, again, just like London Wine Corporation. And again, just like London Wine Corporation, when the company goes insolvent, the customers who have this certificate of title want to be able to protect their assets from the creditors who are going to try and take this gold bullion and sell it off um, to, um, to, to appease the creditors. And so they wanted to argue that they had beneficial rights to that gold bullion. And it was held that no trust was created owing to uh, this lack of subject matter. The case involved homogenous property, okay? Homogenous property being like the case of Hunter and Moss. But the type of property was a chattel. And so, in this case, it was made clear that the certainty of subject matter could not be determined. So even if it is homogenous property like Hunter and Moss, but it is still chattel nevertheless that could clearly be delineated, it could clearly be seg uh, segregated even if it was homogenous, therefore it means there was no subject matter or there is a lack of sub certainty of subject matter. So in the previous two lessons, what we've been doing is talking about the three certainties. We focused in the first on the certainty of intention. And then we spent some time in the second of these lessons talking about the certainty of subject matter. Now, if we remember back to those two lessons, we recall that the certainty of intention, of course, refers to an intention on the part of the person who is creating the trust, the settler or the testator, to actually put that property on trust and for that property to actually be a trust as described. We remember that the certainty of subject matter refers to the specificity that is required in terms of the actual property itself. So it has to be a clearly delimited and a clearly delineated and separated piece of property, whether that property be land, whether that property be money or chattel or even something like stocks and shares. <laughs> 
This lesson is going to talk about the final of the three certainties. We're going to talk about the certainty of objects, talk about essentially who can and cannot be a beneficiary and how a beneficiary has to be defined in this uh, lesson. So the certainty of objects um, is something that requires um, the existence of a beneficiary. So that makes sense because owing to the very nature of a trust, in order for there to exist a trust in the first place, there has to be a beneficiary. Owing to the fact that a trust is essentially a splitting of legal and equitable title to some property between a trustee who holds the property on legal title on trust for the beneficiary, the idea that there has to be a beneficiary is a pretty non-controversial, uh, easy thing to understand. This is what we mean by object of the trust, i.e. the person or people or, or organization that is said to be the beneficiaries of said trust. If there is no clearly identifiable beneficiaries, then as a result of that, there cannot be a trust. Very simple stuff. Now, in 1970, we have the case of Re Gulbenkind's ST. Again, I'm not very good on pronunciation. But the facts of this case are quite interesting because there existed a power of appointment in a settlement agreement in relation to um, somebody known as G's son. OK, this included, quote, any person or persons by whom G may from time to time be employed and any person with whom G from time to time is residing. Quite interesting. And you might already have an understanding of where this might be going in terms of whether or not we can satisfy the certainty of objects here. The argument came when it was claimed that the power of appointment, as stated here, was void owing to a lack of certainty in relation to the objects. So specifically, there was a lack of certainty of objects, a lack of a clearly defined beneficiary. Now, the courts held in fact, that the power was valid. And in doing so, uh, Lord Upjohn uh, outlined the test for establishing what is required for the certainty of objects. So they say the following. They say that when determining a certainty of objects, specifically for a fixed trust, it is a complete list of beneficiaries which must be cited, sometimes known as the complete list test. When determining certainty of objects for a power okay remember we're talking about a power in this case not necessarily a fixed trust when determining the certainty of objects for a power an identification of a person as being part of a class is all that is required a couple of things are done here in this case so firstly it gives us an indication of what is required for the certainty of objects for a fixed trust this is the complete list test the complete list of beneficiaries but it also indicates that there is a difference between a fixed trust and a power in terms of um, the level or the threshold by which we ought to identify a beneficiary for a power Simply the identification of a person as being part of a class is all that is required. But for a fixed trust, the standard is far higher. The standard is the complete list of all beneficiaries. And from quoting in this case, we see that the court must exercise its judicial knowledge and experience in the relevant matter. Innate common sense and desire to make sense of the settler or the party's expressed intentions, however obscure and ambiguous the language that may have been used, to give reasonable meaning to that language if it can do so without doing violence to it. So the final part of this passage, without doing violence to it, essentially refers to the idea of um, stretching and, uh, and, and squeezing the, the language specifically to try and word it in a way that doesn't actually make any sense. So if you can just take the language at face value and you can essentially um, uh, unobscure uh, the, uh, the, the, the language that is used to sort of give a reasonable meaning, a reasonably charitable interpretation of what the language is saying without skewing the language in a way that makes it meaningless, then that is how we are to understand the meaning of the language that is used in a particular instrument. Now, one of the concepts that exists when we talk about the certainty of objects 
is this idea known as conceptual uncertainty. The idea behind conceptual uncertainty is this idea that the beneficiaries of a trust must be described and that this description ought to be conceptually certain at the time. What does this mean? Well, conceptual certainty in this regard, the idea that there has to be a certain amount of conceptual certainty, will refer to the expressed language that is used to describe the beneficiaries, so the specific individuals or organisations which are the beneficiaries, or potentially the class of beneficiaries, so the group by which we are talking about a beneficiary. And from 1979, we have the case of Ribalo's Wills Trusts. Um, and in this case, the owner of a large collection of paintings had died. And essentially, uh, they directed the executor of, the, of her trust sorry, to allow, quote, any member of my family and any friends of mine who wish to do so to purchase any such pictures. So she wanted the pictures to have the ability to be purchased, but she wanted a specific limitation on the people who ought to be able to purchase them, i.e. any member of her family and any friends. Now the issues here, as you may think and understand, is related to this idea of, well, do we have conceptual certainty in terms of the beneficiaries and or the class of beneficiaries? Was this direction conceptually certain in the description of beneficiaries? It was held that it was. In the obiter, however, there was a discussion as to how conceptual uncertainty of the use of friend, the word friends means, uh, what it essentially means. So it was ultimately held that this was conceptually certain enough to, uh, to constitute the existence of a trust for the purposes of the, the, the latter certainty, the certainty of objects. But the obiter of this case does um, include a discussion about this idea of conceptual uncertainty when we apply it to specifically the words friends in this passage, any member of my family or, and any friends of mine. OK, because any member of my family is a relatively conceptually certain understanding we know what a family member is either somebody who is directly related through blood or through legal means i.e through marriage and you can clearly delimit who is and who isn't a family member on that basis but friends is a little bit different because given the variety of shades of meaning towards the word friends or an old friend or a best friend or a close friend it would re render the trust conceptually uncertain as to who may be the beneficiaries. And so as a result of which, words like family, in this case, represents conceptual certainty, but words like friends could represent conceptual uncertainty because you don't have a clear understanding of who is and who isn't a friend, given the fact that there are shades of meanings to the word friends.